This is the new Sony A6700, their new premium flagship APS-C model and probably one of the most interesting products that they've released in that APS-C Super 35mm camera space in quite a while. The A6600 was all the way back in 2019 now. In between that and this, they have released the ZV E10, but that's a bit of a different camera for a different market. So it has been quite a while since we've had anything from Sony in this space. Last year though, they released the FX30, a super 35 millimeter video camera. And this is essentially the stills hybrid version of the FX30. They share a huge amount, including the same sensor. But because Sony have packed so much of their latest and greatest tech into this camera, I do think this is a really interesting option. So let's start by talking about the stills side of the camera, as obviously that's the main difference between this and the FX30, which we all already know. So it's a 26 megapixel APS-C sized sensor. And for the first time in one of Sony's A6000 series, we get that lossless compressed RAW format or HEIF format, which is like a more compressed JPEG version. It's similar to H.265 in the video world. And it can do all of those at quite respectable buffer speeds as well. You can shoot 11 frames a second continuously with full continuous autofocus tracking, and it can have a buffer of up to 1,000 JPEGs or around 60 rules. For video, it has a 6K BSI sensor with twin Bions XR chips inside and that new AI chip that Sony have been putting into their recent cameras, which we're going to talk about more in a minute. Aside from that, it is very similar to the FX30, of course, because they share that same sensor. So that is a 6K sensor that oversamples down for 4K video recording, and you can record that in 4K up to 60p, or if you go into SMQ mode, up to 120p with that slight little crop. And all of that is in 10-bit 422 in either XAVC-SI or XAVC-HS. Sony also say that they've improved the rolling shutter performance as well, which is very welcome. So the camera has a stabilized sensor inside with five stops of IBIS, and Sony say that there's this new precision gyroscope so that the camera is better aware of how it's moving. I don't know if that translates to better handheld stabilization or whether that's something clever in post-production in their Catalyst Brow software. But what I thought we'd do is we'd just roll on this and I'll just walk backwards and we'll see how it looks. This is a 20 millimeter lens. So perhaps the most important thing about this camera is the new AI chip inside. We first saw this in the new A7R Mark V, which is a much more high-end, much more professional camera. And then we saw it in the ZV-E1, which is a sort of mid-range camera, but a bit more vlogging suited. It's nice to now have this in a fully professional APS-C size camera. It basically uses AI to do everything that the camera does slightly better. Mainly here we're talking about auto exposure and auto focus. With auto exposure, it's going to do things like understanding what is a snowy scene, understanding what is a high bright sky, understanding what is a skin tone and what different types of skin tones look like and how to expose for different types of skin tones. So in auto exposure modes, it should nail your exposure much better and things like white balance as well, which is nice. The other big thing is autofocus tracking. You can see it's gluing to my eye amazingly, which most cameras with or without the AI chip can do. But as I move around, it should be tracking a box around my head and tracking me as a person. It should be carrying on being able to tell where my eye is when it, even when it can't really see my eye, all of which is really, really impressive stuff and makes a huge difference to the autofocus capability in these cameras. The third thing is a bit of a party trick, which I'm using right now, which is this auto framing. We saw this on the um, ZV-E1 for the first time. And as I move away, you can see that white box around me is shrinking and the footage being recorded on the camera is shrinking down as well. So that now as I move around, it's going to move the camera around with me. It's a bit like having an auto tracking pan tilt zoom camera but built into a fixed stationary camera, which is pretty impressive. I'm in two minds as to whether or not this is a, a good thing to have in a camera. There are definitely some situations where it will be really, really useful, 
but I do find it quite easy to trip up. Like now it's done quite a good job, but if I come all the way over here, it will do things like that, where it could give me headspace and yet it's sort of cropping me off in a weird way. So it's not always perfect, but in some situations could be really useful. Physically, this is a big improvement over previous A6000 cameras that I've used in the past. And I think mainly that is to do with this larger hand grip here on the side. It's much nicer to use, much more confidence inspiring. It doesn't feel like I'm always about to drop the camera a little bit. There's also three control wheels, which is just so important to have for manual exposure. I don't understand why their previous A6000 cameras didn't have this. There's a control wheel at the front, control wheel on the top, control wheel on the back. Just like we've seen on their other cameras, like their full frame cameras, it makes perfect sense to have it here. I don't know why it wasn't there before. The viewfinder is a 2.36 million dot OLED viewfinder, and it's all right. It's, um, don't think anyone's gonna get too excited about it, to be honest, but it's fine. It's just not quite as good as their really quite fantastic ones on their full frame cameras, like the A7S Mark III cameras like that. It's all the way over to one side and a little bit physically small, which I've never found particularly comfortable to use, but then this is a very small sized camera body. So I guess I can forgive them a bit there. The LCD screen is very similar. It's okay, nothing to really write home about. It is fully touch screen though, which is really nice to use with a new touch screen menu items. It does make a big difference and you can navigate around the camera really quite quickly. In terms of ports, there's an MI shoe on the top. There's one SD card on the slide, which is now UHS-2 rather than UHS-1. There's a USB-C for power, a micro HDMI, which is a little bit of a shame, but there is now both a headphone socket and a um, 3.5 millimeter mic input. So we haven't managed to get long with the camera, so I'm aware that this is a bit of a, quite a rushed first look, sort of first impressions video. We haven't been had time to do any in-depth technical comparison, image quality comparisons, anything like that, which is a shame. Hopefully we'll be able to do those in time for you all. But my first impressions are hugely positive of the A6700. It's nice to see Sony releasing cameras in this APS-C stills hybrid space again, because they are really important, both for people on a bit of a lower budget than say the A7R Mark V, but also for people that just want a smaller camera, perhaps a B camera to a main camera, something like that, a second body for stills, a B camera for video. This is the perfect little camera for that. Is it perfect? No, but it is really quite impressive for what it is. I think the bit that excites me the most is that AI chip and the improvements that that brings. Because in a camera like this, having auto exposure improvements and particularly auto focus improvements, is just fantastic. If you use subject tracking in your mode, in your work, this is just gonna do a much better job for you than a camera without that AI chip inside. And that's really exciting to have in a smaller camera like this. So thank you for watching. If you've got any comments, uh, leave them down below in the comment section. And if you want to order one of these for yourself, head over to provy.co.uk. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.